Yeah, hi, it's uh, great to be here. This is my first uh, visit to NID Surat Kal and whatever I've seen so far has been uh, quite exciting. So I'm really looking forward to sharing some ideas with you here uh, this morning. Uh, so let's see first whether we can make this thing work. Okay, great. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is, uh, as was mentioned, a little bit about my book. And uh, the basic idea, the core idea I want to really convey to you this morning is very simple. What I want to talk to you about is how we need to move from Jugaad, which all of you are probably familiar with. It's something we all do all the time, so I don't need to tell you much about it, to moving to a culture of much more systematic innovation. So we are all very proud of lots of the Jugaad that's happened in India. Farmers all over can put together something that moves from things that are available around the field. They can also block all the roads and highways in western UP with this kind of a contraption. But there are some, both good and bad things about this kind of Jugaad. What are the good things? The good things are that it shows that we have a high level of individual ingenuity. We know we can do things with whatever is available. We can manage with very little resources. We can work in very tight constraints. Somehow we can get it done. We can fix it. And I actually saw quite a lot of Jugaad even happening this morning when I was received at the airport and brought here and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so it's pretty useful in a resource scarce economy, but there are also some limitations that we need to worry about. One of them is that while Jugaad may be a great skill at the individual level, it's not a very great thing if you want to put together more complex stuff. So if you want to go beyond individual ingenuity, if you want to build on a scientific and engineering base, if you want to use all the stuff, you, I'm sure a lot of nifty stuff that you learned here in NIT Suratkal, then you've got to move beyond Jugaad. You've got to start looking for applying scientific and engineering principles to solve complex problems. And by the way, Jugaad is not very good for complex problems because by and large it's not scalable. You have just heard Mohan talking about how they're feeding all those millions of kids. They can't do it by Jugaad every day. If they want to make how a million kids get a midday meal at the same time, good quality and so on, it can't happen by people improvising all the time. There's got to be some system, something in place there that makes it happen. And besides all that, you remember today that the Indian public, all of us here as consumers, we have much higher expectations. We're no longer willing to settle for something that's rough, that's something that's just somehow put together and something that just works. We want aesthetics, we want something which the human machine interface is much better and so on. So I mean, just in a way of summarizing, you can say that, you know, we are no longer happy with the kind of contraptions people put together on Indian fields. We want something like the nano, probably even better than the nano, but something that represents you know, good engineering and good technology going into it. And I think the good news is that in the last decade in India, we have seen some good examples of systematic innovation. What are some of the examples we've seen? We've seen things like the Tata Ace, right there in the, the first picture there. We've seen something like the Bajaj Pulsar. We've seen something like the Tata Swatch. We've seen a huge expansion in retail. People like Kishore Biani have brought retail all over the country through uh, stores like Big Bazaar. And we have incredible examples like Arvind Eye Hospital who have completely revolutionized the way eye surgery is done. So the good thing about all of these is that they have used the ideas, the concepts, the frameworks which go into systematic innovation to make all these things happen. So let's just try and tease out a little bit what's common about some of these things that we have seen here. I think the first thing which is common is that very clearly these people listen very closely to the voice of the customer. They listen to what users need. Now many of you must have heard that Steve Jobs was very contemptuous of people who go and try to listen to customers. He said, look, I know what customers need. I can figure out even better than the customer what kind of solution the customer is looking for. But remember, very few of us have that great intuition, have that great sense of needs that somebody like Steve Jobs have. For most of us, we've got to start in a more systematic way. We've got to go and listen to customers, see them using products and services, try to understand what is it that really makes that product or service work for them, or as the case may be, not work for them so that we can do something better. 
So having an empathy, having an interest in how somebody is using a product or service is absolutely essential as a starting point to systematic innovation. The three ways in which you can actually do this, one is you feel the pain. You see somebody who is not able to use something, who is not able to use it effectively and you find a way of solving that problem. Somebody who felt the pain very effectively was Dr. V, the founder of Arvind Eye Hospital. He saw there were so many people who were, who were suffering from cataract and cataract is something which is easily removable. So this was absolutely needless blindness and he said how can we solve this problem on a huge scale, the kind of scale that Mohan was talking about in the earlier presentation. There is also the possibility that you can sense a wave. Bajaj Pulsar is a great example of a product which sensed a wave. They realize there are lots of guys out there who don't want something like the CD100 which is a kind of you know pretty blah bike or, you know it gets you from one place to another very fuel efficient but you know at the end of the day there's nothing exciting about it and they realized that there are a lot of guys out there like you who will soon be out there working in your jobs you'll have lots of money in your pocket you'll probably be far away from home there's nobody to watch over what you're doing you're looking for some excitement on the weekend when you go out on your bike and the pulsar was born here is a bike which meets the needs of you know young male largely pardon me uh, you know users who are really looking for making a style statement so that's really sensing the wave seeing that there's a new demographic happening out there and then there's the whole issue of seeing waste things which are not being utilized or things that are going wrong many of you might have heard of the kind of innovation that goes on in Toyota they keep their factory absolutely clean so that if anything goes wrong with the machine and some oil is dripping they can immediately find out and they know there's a sense there's a problem there and then they go out and try to solve that problem or you can look at the example I gave you earlier of the Tata Swatch which uses rice husk as the main filtration mechanism for water and rice husk is something that's ordinarily thrown away so they've taken a waste product and converted it into a very useful application so that's another very important part of trying to understand uh, how to do systematic innovation and remember innovation is not all about you know uh, doing really things that nobody has done before in fact a lot of the best innovation is really borrowing and adapting ideas it's taking ideas from one context and applying them in another can you believe that Dr. V, the guy who set up Arvind Eye Hospital, you know where he got his inspiration for increasing the efficiency of eye surgeries was from? From McDonald's of all places. He, sa he said that if McDonald's can give you hamburgers at a quick rate anywhere in the world in franchised locations all over the world, why can't we do eye surgeries much faster in distributed locations? Why can't we just make this a much more efficient process? So inspiration can come from almost anywhere. It's only up to you to see whether you can take something from that and apply it in a new context. So at the heart of all of this is really a whole lot of curiosity for one, but also a discontent with what's happening now. I just caught the end of the last speaker, you know, he was talking about all those mad things he was doing. But also remember, there's a huge discontent obviously, you know, embedded there where he's just not satisfied with what is happening today. He wants to do something better, something different, move on to something else altogether. That's also at the heart of innovation. You, you cannot really continuously seek out new things unless you're also trying to improve things all the time. So there is both a technology component and a human component. And my caution to all of you guys here is, you know, you're all probably very keen on all the latest technology, but technology is not innovation. Innovation happens only when technology solves human problems. If human problems are not being addressed, you're really not doing anything very useful with technology. So try to develop that sense where you're relating technology to a lot of what's happening around you. And don't forget that another important element of systematic innovation is being are covering the entire chain from one end to the other. There's no use just doing one part of the process well. Just think of your experience, for example, when you go to any store or when you go to a, a, a big retail chain or when you go to a restaurant. You want the entire process to be good, right from, you know, the way they greet you when you enter the restaurant till the food you serve, they serve you and, you know, the way you pay the bill and the, till you get out of the restaurant. So one of the most important things of innovation, again, is to be able to cover the entire chain effectively, not leave gaps and not leave some things to chance or to jugad as we started off by talking. Uh, one key thing we also saw common among a lot of these innovations, particularly the five ones that I focused on, 
is a lot of strong leadership support. People put in their lives, they put in passion. They, many of them, unlike Nikhil, I must say, spend almost their whole lifetime trying to perfect one thing. Dr. V spent, you know, 20, 30 years trying to get the Arvind Eye Hospital light, right. So remember that a lot of innovation is hard work. You probably remember, right, Edison had a very memorable statement. He said, it's just 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And that's actually true. So a lot of innovation is really just struggling and trying to solve problems and improving things all the time. So I would just like to emphasize once again that when we think of innovation, we tend to focus a lot on the idea part, on the novelty about doing something new, but innovation is really an end-to-end -end process. It's about identifying a problem or a challenge, solving it in a new way, executing it effectively, and we saw a brilliant example from Mohan, and then finally delivering utility. If you're not, if you, what you are doing is not giving a benefit to a customer or user, you can't really call it an innovation. It's just another invention. It's something which maybe will be put in a museum, but will not actually be used by anybody in real life. So there's no innovation unless you complete all these different steps. So this is what persuaded me to look at all this a little more seriously and write the book called From Jugaad to Systematic Innovation. And a lot of my attention has focused on innovation in Indian organizations. One of the challenges you guys are going to face even if you're very passionate about innovation, is that you're going to go and join companies and work there. Most of you, very few of you are going to have the liberty or the luxury of going and lying on the beach. You're going to have to earn your living probably in one of those big companies out there. And particularly in big companies, you're going to find a lot of barriers to innovation. I'm just going to tell you some of them in Indian companies particularly. You're going to find it's quite difficult to work in teams. You're going to find that and many of you, I suspect, will be guilty of this yourselves. You'll be much more worried about climbing some corporate ladder and showing off to your friends how you're succeeding in the corporate race than doing anything very creative and you know, imaginative and so on. Also, many of you, and I'm sure you've probably seen this already, how many of you really want to get your hands dirty in you know, working on practical projects? Isn't it much more cool to just sit in your room and write some app on, you know, on the computer and distribute it to everybody rather than actually going into a workshop or you know, getting your hands do dirty doing some real stuff? But a lot of the innovation and several of those examples I shared with you involve really getting your hands dirty. So that's going to be another problem. Uh, and you know, there are several other things including a lack of confidence in innovation capabilities. And you're also going to see that many of your organizations seem to have a huge need for control, which prevents you from actually taking up some of the ideas you're working with and carrying them forward. So we really need to change all of this. And that's what I'm here to seek from all of you today, is let's try to change the environment for innovation in India. Let's try to make it more conducive to doing much more systematic innovation. So what do we need to do to do that? I think there are seven important steps we need to take if we want to change the landscape for innovation in India. The first thing is we've got to set up a completely new network of companies. You know, Infosys and all is passe, you know, let's forget about those guys. Let's start a whole new network of small companies which are really creative and taking technology and solving real problems out there. And that's, I think, the challenge for all of you. Let's see how many of you can become the harbingers of the new revolution of technology-driven enterprises in India. This is what will change innovation in India, not trying to transform Infosys or Wipro and so on. I think there's a point beyond which they can't transform, but you guys can change the landscape for innovation in India. Uh, can we enhance the technological capability of existing enterprises, particularly small and medium companies? And this is a great opportunity for all you guys here who are students. Can you work with all the companies around you in, the, in this area and try to help them become more innovative? We've seen that small companies are the best source of employment in the country. In fact, all over the world, small companies provide the most jobs, but they also struggle to be competitive. So can you contribute to that? Can we transform large enterprises? Much more difficult. Can we create a new incentive system for universities and other institutions of higher education? Can we bring in much more research into the curriculum? Can Dr. Sancheti and all your colleagues in, in the faculty here, can they make NITK a much more exciting place? I'm sure it's already exciting, but can you make it even more exciting so that it's much more practical, much more application oriented and much more innovation oriented? Uh, can we change the structure of government involvement in R&D? Okay, that's a little more difficult for all of us individually. But certainly there's something we can do about the last point here. 
can we create supportive societal conditions for industrial innovation? What does this mean? Can we encourage more scientific temper? Can we put more engineering content into all the projects that we do? Can we make sure, for example, I mean, it's not so far away now that soon you guys will be having families and kids and all. Can you bring up your kids to think independently? It's all not so far away. So can we create a completely new environment where all of us want to embrace innovation as a part of life? So what is the academic agenda? The academic agenda, I think, is very specific. The first thing which I think all of you must do, and this is, there's still time to correct it if you haven't done it already, is learn how to work in teams. A lot of the best innovation in the world happens when people work together, when diverse people with different ideas come together. For example, when you have a project, make sure everybody is participating. Don't say, okay, we have, we have five courses, five projects, one guy will do one, one guy will do the other. Don't break up projects like that. That's no learning in that. The way you will learn skills for innovation is when you work together, when your ideas collide with each other, when you have to convince somebody else that yours is the best idea. When you put those ideas together, that's when you learn how to innovate. And learning how to work in teams cannot be done. It's not in a textbook. It happens only in real life by actually working on projects together. Can we work on more design projects? Can we, you know, I, I was really horrified that in many institutions in India, people can go through a whole engineering course without actually making something physical that works. I don't know if it's true here, I hope not. But this whole business of simulation is great, it's fantastic for experimentation. But finally, at the end of the day, the way you learn innovation is by making things with your hands in physical form that work. So I, I would again suggest that. Please take on as many design projects as possible. If in the curriculum, in the curriculum, otherwise do it outside the curriculum. But that's how you will develop uh, design skills, innovation skills. That's how you can possibly be the next Steve Jobs. It's not going to happen just in isolation. Can you do much more open-ended problem solving? Can you look for problems, not the kind which are at the end of the textbook? which all have, you know, everybody knows there's a solution, and I'm sure all the solutions are floating around all the hostels of NIT Suratkal. So that's not no great thrill in solving those problems. Can you take on open-ended problems? Can you take up Mohan's challenge? Can you create, you know, instead of one million, can you create midday meals for five million kids? Those are open-ended problems. And I think the best news we have in India today is any sector you touch, there are huge problems out there. You look at education, you look at healthcare, you look at nutrition, you look at poverty, everywhere. We've got just huge problems and they're just crying for ingenuous solutions. So start looking at tackling open-ended problems instead of only the ones with analytical solutions found in your engineering textbooks. Take advantage of government support. The other great thing that's happening in India is even the government has finally woken up to how important innovation is. We have lots of programs out there to support innovation at different levels. There are startup grants, there are loans for developing technology, there is a technology development board. You know, make use of all of that. It's, you know, it's, that's all our money. So go and demand it. Don't, you know, you don't have to be worried about the bureaucracy. You go and demand that that money be shared with you if you have a good idea. Create a research culture. Start, you know, thinking more about ideas. Start looking at, even as undergraduate students, for example, can you be involved in research projects with your faculty guides and with your uh, uh, friends out here? And once again, thanks to the internet, you know, everybody knows what the problems are now. So it's much easier to develop that kind of a research culture, uh, you know, even sitting in a place like uh, Suratkal, even though you may be quite distant from many of the big industrial centers and so on. You know, a lot of the best innovators in the world are not only good engineers, they're also very good at understanding people. I made that point right at the beginning. So how are you going to understand people if you completely shun the humanities and social sciences? Some of the people who are the best at developing user interfaces, for example, are people like anthropologists, people like sociologists, people who live among tribes and, you know, who've really understood what it means to learn about people. And there's a whole uh, subject called ethnography which uh, builds on that. So never think that your humanities and social sciences courses are a waste. In fact, I believe that one reason why great companies like Infosys and so on were built were because many of the people working in those companies had a much broader vision. They were not only thinking about technology and uh, engineering and so on. They also thought about you know, the other social sciences, about sociology, about economics and so on. They brought that thinking into what they were doing. And finally, the last point I want to make is, I think we should all start cultivating deliberate practice. What is deliberate practice? 
Many of you might have read a book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, one of the core arguments in that book is that if you look at people who have become really good in their particular domain, whether it be a sportsman or whether it be a musician, these guys didn't become great because they had outrageous talent. Yeah, they had some talent for sure, but then so do all of us. The difference is that these guys, very early in their lives, started deliberately trying to improve their capabilities. They worked with coaches, they worked with teachers, they made sure that they were slowly improving their capabilities in every dimension which was required to succeed in their profession. So deliberate practice comes by self-discipline. Deliberate practice comes by having a good guru. And deliberate practice is all about your having your own agenda to improve your own skills. So these are some of the things which I think you folks can do as you know students right here in NIT, which will develop your own skills and tomorrow contribute to the country being a much better place for systematic innovation. Thanks.